brothers and sisters, this is the Remnant Warrior from Kingdom Productions Network. I wanted to thank you all for watching this video and all Kingdom Productions Network content and ask that you please hit the like button because it truly helps the channel grow and new people see the content. And if you aren't already subscribed, please consider hitting the subscribe button and the notification bell so that you'll know each time we upload new content. Grace and peace. Good evening, brothers and sisters. I'm going to do this video about Revelation chapter 1. First off, I just want to say that today was Christmas Day and all over the world people celebrated Christmas. The problem is that a lot of people, when they celebrate Christmas, they only think about Jesus as a baby in a manger. Now, nothing wrong with celebrating the birth of Jesus. Um, by the way, obviously we know that Jesus wasn't born on December the 25th. Uh, they suspect that he was born somewhere in the month of September. But be that as it may, um, celebrating the birth of Jesus, there's nothing wrong with that. But here's the problem. A lot of people celebrate the birth of Jesus and throughout the year, they do whatever they want. They live as they want. They don't live a godly life. They don't live a sacrificed life. Um, they live like they want to. And then suddenly on December the 25th, they want to think about Jesus. And they only think about Jesus as a baby in a manger. They don't see the broader picture. They don't see the whole context. They don't study Jesus's ministry on earth. They don't study his uh, crucifixion. They don't study the fact that he conquered death. They don't study the fact that he um, ascended to heaven. They don't study the fact that he will return as what Revelation 5 chapter, what Revelation chapter 5 verse 5 refers to him as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He will return as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, the problem is being born again. A lot of people out there are not born again. It's only after you've been born again and that you truly have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior that the Holy Spirit will break the Word of God open to you and that you will be able to grasp the full picture of it. Because you can't do what you want, and then suddenly on December the 25th, you want to think about Jesus, but you only have this um, conceptualization in your head and idea in your head that, oh, Jesus was a baby in the manger, end of story. You see, the problem is in our day and time, uh, political correctness and um, you know, being offended by everything is such a massive popular trend that the problem is that the forces of darkness use this picture of Jesus being a, maid, uh, a baby in a manger and your um, concept, your understanding of Jesus only as a baby in a manger, um, they use that as part of a political correct picture because what people don't understand is they only think of Jesus as a baby in a manger and then they also use that as an excuse to make their own type of Christianity by which they say oh well Jesus was small and he was soft and he was just a baby and he also would have been political correct that becomes a precedent, a precedent for saying, well, Jesus would be fine with everything because he was soft and he would also be politically correct. And that then becomes an excuse for saying, oh, OK, I can call myself a Christian, but I can smoke marijuana. I can abuse alcohol. I can watch pornography. I can party with prostitutes. I can get drunk as much as I want. Because Jesus would have been okay with it because he's soft and he's small. Um, you see, they create a, a 
their own counterfeit Christ, which is actually um, like a hippie type of figure, a hippie type of person. Now, obviously, that's not Jesus Christ of the Bible. That's a counterfeit Christ. And if you are a victim of that, then obviously you are serving the spirit of Antichrist. That's the problem. Now, if you get born again and the Holy Spirit breaks the word of God open to you, then you'll understand the big picture. You'll understand that Jesus was not just a baby in a manger. He grew up to be an adult. During his ministry on earth, he was the suffering servant. Okay? And he was 100% man, but also 100% God. So he was God in the flesh, and he did his earthly ministry, and he never committed any sin. Okay? Because although he was 100% man, he was also 100% God. Now, what's important here is that when you read, for example, Revelation chapter 1, you see a totally different picture that, of, of Jesus Christ that John saw. And you start to understand that Jesus Christ is not only the Lamb of God, but he's also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay, so I'm going to read Revelation chapter 1, verse by verse, and I'm going to explain it as I read on. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. That's the prologue, the first three verses. Now what's important here is, it's a revelation from Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, and then, he gave it to his servant John. Now John testified of two things. The word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, chapter, uh, John 1 verse 14. And the word of God is Jesus in the flesh. Um, so the testimony of Jesus is about man coming back to God the Father through the sacrifice of Jesus at Calvary. Jesus taking the sins of the world on him, shedding his blood on the cross, um, dying, conquering death, and ascending to heaven. That old picture there, you must understand as Jesus bringing unification, Jesus bringing oneness between man and God, because there was a, we were uh, basically ripped away from God the Father by sin, because of sin. And Jesus coming to take the sin of the world on him as the perfect sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God. So that is the prologue of the book of Revelation. Now what's important is the third verse of Revelation chapter 1 in the prologue. The final verse of the prologue and the third verse of Revelation chapter 1. It says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Uh, today, sadly, in a lot of churches, and not, not only today, but in ages past also, you have a lot of cessationist teachers and preachers and ministers and whatever you want to call them who tell people in churches that the book of Revelation is merely poetry. They say it's just poetry. It's not, it doesn't mean anything for us today. They say it was only poetry to, um, you know, uh, to uh, comfort the early church. Now, that goes directly against what is written in the Word of God, because it says that blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. It doesn't say this po the, the, these poems or 
this collection of poems. It says this prophecy. The book of Revelation is not poetry. It's prophecy. And it's important because the book of Revelation is the nexus where everything in the Bible comes together. You cannot understand the book of Revelation if you don't understand the Old Testament and if you don't understand the four Gospels and if you don't understand the Epistles. You won't be able to understand the book of Revelation. That's one of the things and obviously as I've already mentioned, the, the, biggest, the, the biggest most important thing here above all is that you should be born again and the Holy Spirit should break the word of God open to you. Then you will truly understand it. So if you are in a church where the preacher or the minister or the teacher or whatever you call him tells you that the book of Revelation doesn't mean anything for us in our day and time and the book of Revelation is only poetry, then my advice to you is get up and get out of that church as fast as you as your two feet can carry you. And pray to the Lord and ask him to give you a new fellowship of believers. People who actually take the word of God serious and who don't make it less than it is. Because the word of God is the truth above all truths. Okay, so that's it for the prologue of Revelation 1. In the next video, I will look at the greetings and the doxology, which is verses 4 to 8. Okay, so now we come to the second part of our study of Revelation chapter 1. And we are now going to look at verses 4 to 8. And this is the greetings and the doxology. Now, it says the following, John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, let's stand still there for a moment. First of all, it says the seven churches in the province of Asia. Now, these seven churches were in what was referred to in those days as Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. Okay. Now, it's very significant that these seven churches were in Turkey, because Turkey, as we know it, is a very militant uh, Islam country. Um, Turkey, their prime minister is actually pushing very hard to have Turkey uh, function as a caliphate. Now, a caliphate is the Muslim law that says that if you uh, don't convert to Islam, you should be killed. Okay? So, it's very harsh, anti-Christian, Islamist rule. Okay? Now, even in those days, being a Christian in Asia Minor, being a member of one of the seven churches was not easy. Okay, you faced persecution on a whole other scale. Okay, on a persecution on a massive scale. So, here we see John writing to these seven churches. And he greets them with grace and peace. He sends them grace. He wishes them grace and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Now, you have three tenses here. You have the past, the present, and the future. And this obviously indicates that the Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is the one who was, he's in the past, he is, he's in the present, and he will be, he is in the future. So he's almighty, he's omnipresent, he's not subject to time, he's also not subject to space and matter. Okay? We human beings in our reality that we live in here on earth, we are subject to time, space, and matter. The triune God, 
God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit is not subject to time, space, and matter. Okay. So, he says, he, he mentions the seven spirits before the throne of God. Now, the seven spirits uh, refers to the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. So, when he talks about the seven spirits before the throne of God, He's actually referring to the Holy Spirit in the sense of a sevenfold ministry that the Holy Spirit has. Uh, when you read the Gospel, and you you read the Gospels, uh, especially the Gospel according to St. John, and you see what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit, you will see that he refers to the Holy Spirit as a helper, in other words, a guide. And also the Holy Spirit is referred to as a comforter, and obviously the Holy Spirit is referred to as a protector. So there we have a threefold ministry of the Holy Spirit. There are other four functions of the Holy Spirit that we might not be acquainted with as human beings in the sense that we cannot understand God. Um, God is almighty, we are not. Okay. So we know that the Holy Spirit is powerful. We know that the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. We know that the Holy Spirit associates, him, associates Himself with order. If you read Genesis chapter 1, you will see that the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep waters. And the moment the Spirit started hovering over the deep, what follows? Order, not chaos. There was chaos, but the moment the Spirit started hovering over the waters, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, there's a strict order according to which God creates heaven and earth. So the Holy Spirit of God associates himself with order, not with disorder, not with chaos. Okay? If you are in a church where there's hypercharismania hyper going on, people falling down and getting convulsions and... Um, foaming from the mouth and they tell you that that's the Holy Spirit. That is not the Holy Spirit. That's a counterfeit Holy Spirit. It's the Kundalini Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit of God never associates himself with chaos and disorder. The Holy Spirit of the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob associates himself with order. Because God created heaven and earth according to a strict order. Okay? The Holy Spirit as a sevenfold spirit before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So bad news for all the governments of the earth who are so arrogant and who think that they are in control, they are not. Go and read Psalm 2, the second Psalm. It says that the nations conspire against God. They have a conspiracy against God. And God, what is God's reaction? God laughs at them. And it's Psalm 2 is actually forms a very good parallel with Psalm 110, where we see Jesus as the Holy One sent from God the Father as the King of Kings. So a king ruling over a nation, a government ruling over a nation, it will do them good if they actually acknowledge Jesus Christ as the only true Messiah and the Lord and the Savior of the world. But if they don't, and they focus on themselves and they have a nefarious agenda, then they God laughs at them. You see? So Jesus is the faithful witness. We know that he's faithful. And he's the first born from the dead. He conquered death. And he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He is the king of kings. All right. Now he continues and he says to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. All right. So here we see clearly Jesus redeeming us from death 
That's why the Apostle Paul mocks death in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He mocks death. He says, death wears thy sting. Death wears thy victory. Because if you are truly a follower of Jesus Christ, death is just a stage through which you go to eternity. We know that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul clearly tells us that this world is not our home. This world is just a place where we are passers by. We have an earthly tent and we are looking forward to the permanent residence that we will have in heaven, in the new Jerusalem, with Jesus Christ. And we will be with the we will be there with him. Okay. Look, he is coming with the clouds. So, in other words, John is saying, Jesus is not just a baby in a manger. Jesus did not die on the cross and then it was the end. He conquered death. He ascended to heaven and he's coming back. He's coming on the clouds. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Now this refers to the prophecy uh, recorded by the prophet Zechariah. In um, Zechariah chapter 12. Uh, more specifically, Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. And this refers to um, the remnant of Israel. The Israel will go through the time of Jacob's trouble in, in the last days. And a lot of them will perish, but there will be a faithful remnant and they will acknowledge Jesus Christ. They will finally acknowledge him as the true Messiah. They will look upon him whom they have pierced and they will weep bitterly. Then they will realize this man that we crucified back in the day, he is actually the true Messiah. Okay. Then he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. Once again, we have the three tenses, past, present and future. Um, God, um, once again, confirming himself to be the Almighty One. Okay. He says, the Almighty. That's how he ends verse 8. So, in other words... <clears throat> When we look at the greetings and the doxology, we can clearly see how this was dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ. It was dedicated through the Holy Spirit to the Lord Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ to God the Father. Now, getting back to what I said in the previous video in the prologue, when we look at verse 3, this is not just poetry. This is a prophecy. It was given to John by Jesus Christ. So people who tell you that this is merely poetry. Don't have the faintest idea what they're talking about. They are deceived. Alright. And Jesus Christ being the Alpha and the Omega. The King of Kings. Who will come and who will judge righteously. Over the living and the dead. He will be the one to bring righteous judgment. In this world, in this secular world, we will never have righteous judgment. Okay? <clears throat> the courts can judge a criminal, but many times a criminal gets away with it because he has a good lawyer. And people get sad and they think, when, when will justice prevail? Um, that murderer or that rapist will get away with it. They will not get away with it. If they don't come to Jesus Christ and they don't get born again, then at the judgment, they will stand before God and he will judge them righteously. And if they don't, if they haven't been born again, they will be cast into the lake of fire. Where they will be tormented alongside Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet and all the forces of darkness. Okay, so that's it for the greetings and the doxology. And then in the next video, we will look at John's vision of Christ. 
uh, which is actually the central part of Revelation chapter 1. Okay, brothers and sisters, so we are at our final video for uh, Revelation chapter 1. And this goes from verse 9 to verse 20. So this is John's, John's vision of Christ. Now, he writes here, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Now, remember, the island of Patmos was a place where um, people were exiled there. So John was actually a prisoner. Um, because of his love for Jesus Christ. Because he was a follower of Jesus Christ, he was imprisoned and he was exiled to the island of Patmos. Okay, They basically had a labor colony there on Patmos. And um, John was sent there. And at that time, as I understand it, he was already uh, an old man. Okay, So he wasn't young anymore. Now, Pay careful attention why he was sent there, because he's a follower of Jesus Christ, but he keeps running the race. In the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul talks about the race that we run as followers of Jesus Christ. And he says we, that we keep our eyes fixed on the end of the race. Now, this alludes to Psalm 23, where we are told that the, the, the Lord our God leads us on the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And this also alludes to Jesus in John chapter 10, who says that he is the good shepherd and his sheep knows his voice. And we should keep our eyes fixed on the shepherd and we should keep our eyes fixed on the end of the race. We shouldn't get distracted by all kinds of small um, roads on the side, you know, that, that will lead us astray and that will cause us to, to uh, fall into darkness. Okay. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Because the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ was the foundation on which John built. Once again, we are reminded of Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 to 27, where Jesus Christ said that um, the one who heeds the gospel is like a person who builds his house upon a solid rock. Okay. If we don't build our house on the solid rock, if we don't build our house on Jesus Christ as our rock, and obviously you are like a person who built your house on sand and the storm come and it blows the house, it basically destroys it. The Apostle John, um, uh, John obviously, uh, as well as Paul, uh, Peter, um, all the others, all the other apostles, they all endured suffering because during tribulations, during trials and during sufferings and all these hardships, they knew that they had their spiritual house built on the rock. Their foundation was Jesus Christ. No one, no other, okay? No other false messiah. Not Nimrod, not Tammuz, not uh, Bacchus, not anyone else. Only the one true Messiah, Jesus Christ. Be careful of people in our day and time who tell you that there are many ways to God. We know this is a new age lie from the pit of hell. There's only one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. John 14 verse 6. Jesus says, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to God the Father except through him. Okay. Um, 
Verse 10, on the Lord's day I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, uh, Theatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. Now obviously these are the seven churches in Turkey, uh, which was called in those days Asia Minor. Um, now John says the following, he says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. Now remember what I said in the first video. We cannot be followers of Jesus Christ and only think of Jesus being in a manger in Bethlehem. Okay, that's missing the bigger picture. Okay, carefully note what John says about Jesus. Jesus, like John saw him, is not a baby in a manger, it's not a hippie guy with long hair. This is Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Lion of the tribe of Judah who will return to judge righteously over the living and the dead. He says the hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, okay? And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. Now, it's important to note that he says that Jesus, when he spoke, his voice was like rushing waters because the thing is that Jesus also said that the one who heeds my words, streams of living water will flow from him. Now, this refers to the powerful working of the Holy Spirit. When uh, living waters flow from you, as you preach the gospel and as you shine the light of Jesus Christ in this dark world, then it means that the Holy Spirit works through you, okay? And the Holy Spirit is the one laying the words in your mouth and you speak the word of God, all right? Now, um, the sound of rushing waters, this shows us that um, as pertaining to the Spirit, the living waters flowing from us, Jesus also speaks and his voice sounds like rushing water. And this alludes to once again how Jesus and the Holy Spirit is one and obviously Jesus and the Holy Spirit is also one with the Father okay so the triune God Father Son and Holy Spirit now a very important verse 16 in his right hand he held seven stars and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword what is this sword coming out of Jesus's mouth this is the word of God Hebrews 4 verse 12 tells us that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword and it is a discerner of the thoughts. So when Jesus speaks, he speaks the word of God because he is the word of God that became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, And he is the light of the world and also the word of God, we know that it is the light that drives away the darkness. All right. Um, his face was like the sun shining in, in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Pay careful attention. John is falling on his feet, he's falling forward. He's not falling backward. In many of these hypercharismatic churches, people fall backward. And they talk about being slain in the spirit. That's counterfeit. The moment you see Jesus Christ, you fall forward. Why? Because falling forward down means that you are falling down in worship okay you're falling down in worship and then he placed his right hand on me and said do not be afraid i am the first and the last i am the living one i was dead and now look i am alive forever and ever and i hold the keys of death and Hades. so jesus conquered death so the forces of darkness have no control over death. They cannot hijack, when you die, they cannot hijack your soul and take it to um, 
take it somewhere else. If you have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you die, you go to paradise. Okay? And Jesus conquered death. Death is just a way. It's just a, one of the ways on our journey to the new Jerusalem. Okay? Write therefore what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven gold, the golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels. Uh, some translations say messengers, but remember angel, um, I can't remember what the Greek is for angel, but in Hebrew it's malakim. Now malakim means messenger. Okay. So the seven stars are the angels, or Malakim, the messengers, of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now pay close attention that um, these seven churches are seven lampstands, so they are supposed to shine the light of Christ in this dark world. And then very importantly, uh, every church has an angel assigned to it. So um, once again, this shows us that during trial, during tribulation, during suffering, Christ's um, the triune God sends his angels to protect people to protect the, the um, fellowship of believers um, God never forsakes those who loves him okay these people were in Asia Minor a very difficult place um, during those days it was under Roman rule if if I if I if I'm not mistaken, and these days Turkey is under um, Islam Caliphate rule. So um, if you are a believer there, then what you see with the seven churches, um, even if you're a believer in South Africa like me or in the United States, United Kingdom, wherever, all over the world, you see that um, just as tribulation came to the seven churches in Asia Minor and as it will come again to uh, believers who are in modern day Turkey so it will come to all believers no matter where in the world you are but we find comfort in the fact that we serve the one true creator of heaven and earth we find comfort in the fact that Jesus Christ never forsakes us and we find comfort in the fact that God sends his angels to watch over us and to protect us so Coming back to what I've said in the first video, there's no point in only focusing on Jesus in a manger. There is so much more. And I hope and I pray that people watching this video who don't know Jesus Christ will be inspired and will um, that the Holy Spirit will touch them and truly get them to be to be born again. Okay? That you will truly be born again and that you will come to Jesus Christ and have a relationship with him as your Lord and Savior.